Welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to meet everybody. Um, my name is Michael Goldberg. Um, for those who have not met, some of you um, have known, Ken, I've known for a long time. Um, I run our Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship uh, here at the university, also a professor um, at Weatherhead. Um, this is the end of our AI um, set of conversations this semester. It's our last event of the year. Um, as we head into exams and, and finals and summers and all this good stuff. Um, Mike Fisher, who's with us today, is a Weatherhead double alum and um, kind of kicked off our series earlier this year with a chat with the intended, a chat on ChatGPT. Um, and then that led to um, an idea about bringing together other folks on campus that are um, engaged in using AI and um, thrilled to partner with our friends, um, not just in, in art history, and I know Ken is um, from our Department of Physics, so really thrilled to bring together today's speakers. Um, Sarah Wong is going to be our student moderator sitting right next to me, um, and I know Andrew's going to kick off um, with a couple of slides. Um, for those that are in the room here, obviously at Thinkbox, we want this to be as interactive as possible. So just let, well, Sarah will sort of start with some questions and then we'll we'll um, take questions from, from the audience. And if you're watching on Zoom, just put your questions in the chat or let us know by raising your hand. We're also streaming on LinkedIn Live and welcome to everybody who's joining there. Um, and if you're on LinkedIn Live, just put your question in the comment and then we'll be monitoring it that way. Um, so with that, Sarah, I'll, let me turn it over to you and thank you for moderating today and maybe introduce yourself as well. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Wong. Um, I am a first year here at Case Western Reserve University, and uh, I plan on majoring in art history and um, computer science. I uh, found uh, the, this project very interesting, and it's a really cool integration of these two um, uh, fields. So I'm glad to be here today. Uh, pleasure to meet everyone. Um, we just turn it over. Andrew, do you want to pick things off with a few slides? And great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm Andrew uh, Van Horn. I'm the uh, the uh, D. Keith and Margaret B. Robinson postdoctoral fellow in data science and art uh, here at Case. Um, and I just am going to talk about uh, talk about our project just a little bit to uh, to give a sort of introduction. Um, so the, the first order of business um, is uh, Ken and Mike uh, implore me, beg me to explain the title of my presentation, um, <laughs> Prudent Modeler of All That Is Seen. Um, that is a, a quote from uh, El Greco, the, uh, the uh, uh, 1500s and uh, 16 early, very early 1600s uh, painter uh, in Spain. It's, course of Greek origin, hence uh, El Greco, um, and he painted uh, the Baptism of Christ, which is the, uh, the painting or part of the painting that you'll see there uh, on the left side of the screen. Uh, and in a, uh, a sort of marginal note uh, in a, a book on architecture that he had, he wrote uh, about the sort of the primacy of painting as, uh, as an art um, because of its ability to uh, you know, to express everything that we see, right? So it's a prudent model of all that we've seen. And that's uh, not an unusual, um, not an unusual sentiment for, uh, for a painter of his, of his era, uh, no less a luminary than uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, once argued uh, that uh, painting was superior to sculpture uh, because it was a science of perspective and light, um, and that unlike uh, sculpture, which was uh, mechanical art, uh, you didn't get have, have to get sweaty to do it. Um, but of course, uh, Leonardo is ignoring uh, the fact that a lot of uh, a lot of uh, artists like him had uh, a lot of help. They had uh, workshops. And there were many uh, apprentices uh, in their workshops, you know, grinding uh, pigment for paints, uh, stretching canvases over uh, frames, uh, mixing uh, plaster for frescoes, 
right? Um, and in some cases, the journeyman artists in the workshop would actually lend their hand, um, as it were, to the painting itself. So when we think of, at least in the popular imagination, when we think of art, uh, when we think of these, these great artists from the, uh, from the Renaissance and early modern period, we tend to think of them as these, uh, you know, these luminaries of working sort of on their own. Um, and while they did, uh, you know, uh, while they were responsible for the uh, composition of a piece and, of course, uh, assuming all the risk, right, <laughs> involved, um, in the, uh, at least at the level of the paint, uh, many of these masterworks are really actually quite collaborative. Um, and that was really the, uh, the question that we were interested in. So are we able to determine how many hands are at work in a particular painting? Um, and are we able to, uh, perhaps down the line, be able to actually identify the work of the master, right? Um, in, you know, a complex masterwork that's over 400 years old. Uh, so the way that we work on this, uh, we actually rely uh, a great deal on our uh, collaboration with uh, art historians. Um, so the art historical scholarship provides us with uh, what we could call hypotheses or hypothetical attributions um, of paintings. So uh, here we're dealing with, uh, the, you know, the painting we're going to deal with today is the Baptism of the Christ, uh, which was one of the last works that El Greco worked on uh, before he died. And when he died, it was left to his son, uh, Jorge Manuel. Uh, to eventually finish it, um, and it was delivered to uh, the uh, people who had ordered it at the Hospital Tavera uh, in 1624, uh, 10 years after uh, El Greco uh, had passed on. So uh, the based on uh, stylistic uh, analyses, we have a sort of general idea of maybe who painted what. So it looks like El Greco painted much of the top and sort of this angel on the side. Uh, and you can see that uh, he and Jorge Manuel may have worked together on the body of Jesus. But then there's some more questions around uh, the body of, uh, for example, John the Baptist, who we uh, collectively refer to as JBAP. Um, <laughs> now, one of the uh, uh, unique things that we do uh, here is uh, that we do in our project is uh, we work with uh, topographic data. So we're dealing with the height of the paint off of the canvas. Um, and so we use uh, optical profilometry to measure the height of the paint at a very fine scale. Uh, and then we get an image, that sort of grayscale image that we have over there. Um, the next step is we have to trick a neural network because we're mean. Um, you know, we, uh, so we have a, a convolutional neural network, CNN, uh, and it assigns patches of an image. Uh, it's designed to assign patches of an image. Normally, they would be the, uh, the height data there, but that just doesn't look as pretty as these images. Uh, it assigns patches of each image to the correct class. So patches of a painting to the correct painting or patches of a region of a painting to the correct uh, region. Now, in past work before I got here, uh, our collaboration showed that uh, the network was able to uh, succeed in, in, with a very high degree of accuracy in dis uh, distinguishing between paintings by two different artists. So if we give it two paintings by two different artists, um, it should, it's very, very accomplished, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, at uh, assigning the patches to the correct uh, painting. So then we thought, well, what if we gave it two paintings by the same artist and but told it it was paintings by two different artists? Uh, it should fail at doing that. And in fact, it does. Um, when we give it paintings uh, by different artists, of course, very accurate. But when we give it paintings by the same artist, um, it really doesn't do much better than a coin flip, generally speaking. Um, so this is important. This is how we can distinguish. Uh, we're able to tell if an area, a region of a painting is painted by the same uh, painter as another region of a painting, right? So if the network can't learn to distinguish between two regions, 
and we can assume that those regions were painted by the same hand. And this is different from the normal process where we would train model, we train the network to learn to distinguish between things, and then we would give it some novel thing to distinguish between. Um, and then eventually we uh, use network analysis to actually uh, figure out which regions are by the same hand. Uh, so we select regions of the painting. So here is uh, the, you know, all of the regions that we took. Uh, we try to select them so that there are, uh, you know, there's a minimal amount of uh, different things depicted in a particular region. And we also have to, you'll see there's some empty areas where uh, there's some significant cracking and that sort of thing that might be, uh, might be a problem. Um, and once we run it through our, our whole algorithm, we come out with something like this, which looks like a complete mess. Uh, but through the magic of network analysis, we're able to actually assign these, uh, these patches uh, to uh, communities, essentially communities that we believe are uh, representative of uh, uh, one hand, quote unquote. Um, so you can see up at the top there, uh, the image of God and some other parts are uh, theoretically could be, that could be the hand of El Greco himself. Um, and then some work perhaps by him and his son in the green. Uh, and then his son, Jorge Manuel, uh, all by himself in the blue, uh, painting all of uh, JBAP's various features. And then down in the bottom, uh, there is a, a sort of third uh, potential individual uh, painting the uh, Jesus's legs and the rocks at the bottom. And this, uh, this seems to correspond uh, somewhat roughly. So we are able to actually confirm some of the, uh, you know, some of the uh, art historical hypotheses, but we also uh, have sort of augmented them in uh, a bit here, right? So um, there's, there's some, there's some overlap and, and some interesting new findings. Um, so in conclusion, uh, basically uh, we, for the baptism, we, we think we have four hands uh, at work, uh, although there may be just three individuals. Um, and we you know, confirmed and rejected some of the original attributions. Um, and then as far as the method is concerned, um, it seems to be a powerful method for confirming our historical attributions. Um, and although we still have uh, at least one, we have many open questions, of course, but one of the significant open questions is what, what constitutes a hand, right? If two artists paint over one another, is that a separate hand from how is that going to be represented? And that's some of the work that we're working on for the future. Um, so like a Renaissance workshop, as uh, Clara pointed out the other day, um, our, uh, our collaboration is very collaborative. Um, we, we could not, the, the AI is perhaps sort of like, uh, I mean, is it the master? I don't know, you know, maybe we don't wanna say that. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, of course there are a lot of, uh, a lot of us out here, uh, you know, pounding pigment and stretching canvas. Um, and we, uh, you know, I just want to take a just brief moment to, uh, Again, thank uh, Keith and, and uh, Margie Robinson for their uh, generous uh, gift, uh, which has allowed me to do all of this work. And that is it. Oh, it's back. So. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Let's stop the screen. You want to stop the screen oh, there sure. and we'll. All right, Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much for your um, presentation. Um, I just had a few questions. Um, what do you think that your research means for the further integration of AI into art history as a field? Uh, there's a lot of different areas uh, right now that are really looking to take advantage of AI. Um, do you think that your project is kind of you hope that it encourages further implementation that is similar, or are there other ideas that you think uh, might happen? 
Uh, well, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of different avenues that, uh, you know, AI in art history uh, can possibly take, you know, there's, uh, they just recently, uh, you know, reconstructed a, a Rembrandt uh, that had been destroyed by some, uh, some local idiots. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Rembrandt had been, you know, uh, pieces of it, huge swaths of it had been cut off, uh, and they used uh, AI to, um, and a previous uh, copy to sort of generate a new, uh, a new, new parts of that image, right? Um, so that kind of, uh, there's, you know, there's a few different avenues, I think, um, you know, there's, there's that kind of conservation, um, there is, uh, of course, attribution, which is what we do. Um, but I think, you know, I think our, uh, I think in a sense, you know, we, uh, what we do with sort of confirming attributions and that sort of thing, um, I think, you know, there's a lot of room to, uh, you know, grow the, the types of methodologies that can be used for that. Um, yeah. And, and I think, and I think if the I can I help uh, in supporting that. And I think Blair wants to say something. So, yeah, if I, if I can jump off of Andrew's point, I think that. Um, there's a lot of room in our history for using AI as a tool. Um, and as, as, as Andrew pointed out and, and the base of our project, um, as kind of the, the, the micro support to the larger kind of broader ideas. Thank you. Um, what would you describe as the most distinctive aspect of your research in particular? Um, um, I'm happy to take or if you guys want to. <laughs> I'd say there are two. One is when we're, we're doing the machine learning on the profilometry, so measuring the height yeah, of the whole thing. And in our earlier study, actually, we showed that um, the machine learning actually focused on very short time scale, not night scales on the order of actually even down to microscopic levels. So it's a different way of looking at brush strokes. Um, and then the second is the method that Andrew developed for um, comparing two, two uh, places at a time. Um. Oh Andrew, there's a quick, quick follow-up from Professor Glassman on there. Um, and for those on LinkedIn, it's saying, can you explain to those who are, are laypersons the extent to which AI is thinking and synthesizing? Um, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I would say it's not, um, it's, when you think about, uh, when you think about this, these kinds of networks, um, you know, it's, um, it's not so much uh, thinking as it's perhaps perceiving, and and maybe um, I, got, I got a nod from Mohammed, so I know I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mohammed's our our resident computer scientist, so so I'm I'm all set. Thank God. Uh, so yeah, um, I feel like it's it's more it's more of a it's more of a perception thing. So it's um, it's taking in uh, it's taking in the data and then. Um, uh, really, it's it's uh, you know lighting up. It's turning on and turning off, uh, essentially something akin to a neuron, um, so akin to like a, a photoreceptor, um, you know, being turned on and off. You know, a, a bunch of different uh, connections being turned on and off, and does that correctly? Uh, can it you know can it turn the right things on and off to correctly identify? Um, so yeah, in a way, it's not really it's not really doing any any thinking. Um, yeah, I should have just stopped at perceiving. I think yeah, I'll stop yeah. there. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, and and to follow up on that, I mean, you can kind of group AI in, in general into two big categories. In one sense, you have like pattern recognition, which is what we're essentially doing, right? And um, so we're trying to recognize patterns, we're trying to distinguish between patterns, and the AI, which is generative, which basically trains on a bunch of existing patterns 
and then generates new samples from that that look similar to the existing patterns. And despite all the you know the hype around ChatGPT, I mean essentially that's what it's doing. It's it's in some sense an extremely elaborate and uh, creative plagiarizer, right? Trained on a huge set of patterns of human language and generating new samples from this. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, those are the two basic fundamental categories of AI. And neither one, I, in, in some sense, could really be authentically thought of either as thought or, or creativity. Could you describe, or I guess further elaborate on, since you already touched upon it, uh, is the greatest benefit in working in this multidisciplinary manner with um, these two different fields? Uh, well, I mean, number one, uh, it gives me a job. <laughs> it's a it's a great it's a great thing for an anthropologist um, to be able to. Uh, no, it's um, uh, you know I think we uh, you can't like like Mike was saying the the AI itself you know isn't um, you know it's not really it's not really doing this like sort of thinking it's not it's not doing any real heavy I mean it's doing heavy lifting it's lifting heavily. Uh, but but we're you know we we need um, a a really sort of uh, you know we need the the art historians uh, input to to really you know give us a sense of like what are what are we looking for right um, you know what are we looking for what are we trying to trying to find here um, and you know uh, without that sort of interdisciplinary. Uh, you know, set up. And, and I think too, you know, uh, you know, some of what, uh, you know, where I was able to come up with the, the idea to run this, you know, do this particular method, uh, you know, came from my background in like social science, which is, you know, we use, you know, much simpler, but very different statistical <laughs> analyses than often the, the physicists use. So I think when you get a lot of different uh, people together, you know, you really get, you know, some great ideas. Another question from the Zoom, uh, from Professor Glassman, asking, uh, do the art history professors or scholar uh, and AI work together or do they work separately? Uh, so, yeah, so our, uh, you know, what we initially do is, uh, you know, the art historians will uh, sort of go through uh, the literature and try to find uh, where people have done these kinds of stylistic uh, qualitative analyses in the past. Um, and, and then we, once we have that, then we sort of have a base, a, a sort of baseline as to what we're looking for. Um, and we can go in and try to, try to confirm that or perhaps, you know, append to it as we have here, right? So we're, uh, in a sense, you know, the the kinds of stylistic analyses that they're that they're doing, uh, we're we're not evaluating them per se. Uh, we're using them as a jumping off point. I would say. Um, oh, and, <laughs> and, and, and crucially, what's interesting is that the AI is blinded to the answers. It's blinded to the hypothesis, right? So it doesn't know. Um, all all it has access to is small patches of high data. It doesn't know anything about the prior. It, there's no like bias in terms of the prior hypothesis. It doesn't know anything about the color. It doesn't know how these patches necessarily fit together in, into a larger whole. It's really evaluating, you know, region by region and a fairly small patch. These are on the order of like I think one or two centimeters or uh, one centimeter, one right. centimeter for Alberto. Yeah. Um, and so from one centimeter, one centimeter patch is basically just looking at the height data. And that's all it has in terms of to make this. So it's a way of doing these, these analyses in some sense that is very different from what art historians have been have been doing, but in a way it's complementary. Uh, that's that's the whole. So um, there's also working together and crossing disciplines. So, so Clara, for example, attends all the meetings and we will ask her questions sometimes based on you know what we're trying to learn um and also one of the originators of the project who was a student graduate student in art history 
she's now doing uh, AI um, professionally mm -hmm. as an art historian and curator at, at the, uh, the, the collection in Pittsburgh. Yeah, it's. Oh, you go. Please, please, Mom. Go ahead, Clara. Um, yeah, I, I was going to add to Ken's point. Uh, yeah, I met at most meetings. It was started by Lauren. And, and so when Andrew comes across like you know, a figure that we're kind of not sure whether it was painted by one or two or, or multiple hands, like Lauren and I will consult some literature and we'll think about how painting workshops were operating at the time and, and what might be like a reasonable assumption or or hypothesis to make like on particular figures so it's like we're there in the fine details we're there in the large question i mean this is like a collaboration through and through yeah i think it's it's just very important to to make note of the fact that ai in this project and in general is more viewed as a tool not as a replacement to any one per se or to any i know the creator or artist or professor or anything we would never trust AI solely by itself because AI can easily be fooled and can easily give wrong assumptions and wrong mistakes based on I don't know faulty data, based on faulty just experiment design, based on faulty everything. You can fool an AI by adding just a tiny bit of noise and it's shown all over in the CS literature. It's as long as we are not sure how it works, it's very hard to trust it 100 percent So it is more. Uh, like complementary of just work of the scholar and the art history who can confirm or deny whatever they are saying. Um, the uh, next steps for this project, uh, like for your team in general, are there any other applications of this technology that you're looking for? Um, or are there other applications that you think that this uh, AI can be used for uh, outside of your skill? Well, one thing we're doing, uh, our original um, project involves students at the Cleveland Institute of Art who made painting. Basically, we designed an experiment. They made paintings. And that experiment was just to look at to see if everybody uses all the same materials paints the same object is there something about the style and we found it very much so and we've been kind of building on that now but we're now in the middle of a second uh experiment with students at at the institute where um, they do a workshop painting, but they also do other paintings unrelated, and then they mix some of them use different paints, different all sorts of different things. So we're trying to kind of push the the boundaries on, on where it might work. And we we have uh, at least two more of El Greco's paintings were actually, the um, these El Greco paintings were all provided by the Factum Foundation in Spain. They have a uh, um, dietary scanner that's able to move right up to the painting and do a, you know a whole huge painting. And um, they just developed a new scanner that can do it a lot faster. So you know. <laughs> More. Another question from Professor uh, Glossman. Uh, was AI used in recent determination by National Gallery of Art that a certain painting was not by Vermeer himself? I'm going to pass that one to Clara. I think they did. Um, <laughs> Um, I believe that AI was involved in some way. To what extent? Because um, this came out 
a few months ago, I think. Um, and I should read up on it again. I think that AI was was slightly involved in the attribution or the, the reattribution. Um, but yes, there 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 are some people who are using AI. Um, I believe that I don't know if it was a a, a topographical scan um, or if it was more of like a, a 2D um, no, AI. I, did, I believe it was, the, it was probably the color um, or it was probably oh, yeah. yeah high res image. So um, I would be a bit more critical of that, but that's you know. It, yeah, I think the um, I mean I think one of the keys you know one of the key things that I that I always uh, I always bring up um, uh, is you know, with that kind of, um, with those kinds of determinations, that kind of attribution, um, you know, the, the art historians have so many really great qualitative or historical tools that they use already. Um, and, you know, I, I say this every time I, I talk about our project, because um, the art historians told me I had to say it every time I talk about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, we, uh, but yeah, they have they have so many so many great tools um, that uh, you know are are really useful already. You know that that have to do with you know the the, the weave of the canvas, right? There was um, uh, and and things like that. Um, uh, the you know the types of pigments, the types of paints used. Um, you know, like uh, to you know, I don't I don't think people use lead white today. For example, probably it's, it's nope. not real great for you. Um, but the uh, you know, so people uh, you know the the types of paints, the types of pigments that are used. Um, so there's a lot of those kinds of like historical methods that are are very good for this. And now that I'm thinking about it, I think the once I said the thing about the the canvas weave, that may have been what they did. Um, it may that may be the Vermeer that I'm thinking of, where they they used AI to look at the specifically to look at the canvas weave, and to look at it across several paintings. I think from the same time or something like that. Um, uh, you know, several Vermeers from the same the same period. And um, so, I mean, you know, that's an interesting thing. Uh, you know, the, the the weave of of different fabrics and that sort of thing is definitely something that that AI could be used for. Uh, I was recently uh, talking with somebody from a uh, 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 fashion trade publication about that they're using AI to, um, you know, make sort of uh, fabric weave barcodes essentially on, uh, on uh, uh, I'm sorry, high-end handbags. For example. So, um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's possible. It's, it's definitely a, a, it's a possibility, but I would, I would always, I would always, you know, check with the with the art historians. I think, you know, it seems circular, but it's that's by design, right? <laughs> we want and to there was, constantly check one another. <laughs> and if there was, uh, like, if there was, there was probably questions circulating, yeah, in art historical communities. Um, I myself am not a scholar of Vermeer, um, so I'm not uh, privy to those conversations. But yes, I I assume that if they were thinking about removing the Vermeer attribution, then this was, as Andrew said, one of many tools that were probably used in their re-attribution. Yeah, if you could just introduce yourself when you ask a question, would be great. Thank you. Uh, so this is very interesting to me. Um, when I was um, in my undergrad, I was always thinking like, how are these things are relevant to the society. I was not good at research at all, so I so I switched to business. <laughs> <laughs> I want to share some of my thoughts when I look at these. It's very exciting. Um, I want to get back to your question about like uh, the nexus actions and implications. Just my thought about like two things. One, I feel like you already talked about conservation. Uh, that is a, a application. Um, we have a case of my who work at the uh, Cleveland Conservation Center. 
So she's the new executive director there. And I think that might be a good connection there. Um, the other thing is about appraisal. Like, you know, like you can see this is give a second opinion. Um, this is real or not. Like the auction house will let it. And uh, <laughs> I'm probably thinking too much. It's like, you know, the law school has the IP law and then you can form a venture there and you can collaborate <laughs> with the other head and then you know. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, yeah. about, uh, um, you mentioned you can scan the entire painting, but you chose boxes. Mm -hmm. I think my question is, did you choose the boxes for where to you know to judge? Um, and why not just scan it, like feed everything in and let it determine? every single square inch of the painting? Like, was there some reason you only chose certain samples, you know, like the body of Christ and stuff? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so the, um, uh, there's a, there's a several different factors there. Uh, so the, the first is um, our, the, the way that we sort of uh, validated our method was with the original paintings that the uh, CIA students had done. Uh, and those were, um, those were like uh, uh, the patches, there were 180 patches. Of those. Um, so we, that was sort of our floor, uh, what we felt like we could definitely use a, a, a region that, you know, that small. Um, and then we, we kind of capped it at about three times that size. Uh, somewhat arbitrarily, <laughs> but uh, we were sort of like, well, we're not going to take it much bigger than that. Um, there are methods that we we uh, could use, uh, for example, um, uh, unsupervised learning, right, um, where we can we can just sort of let it, you know, take all of the patches for the whole thing and just sort of see what it can do. Um, and We've we've done that. Uh, we had done that previously, and it's you know it, it shows some interesting things, but it doesn't really um, it doesn't quite give us the uh, that you know sense of like well this person you know this region is this person and this and this region is also this person like these are connected somehow this is the same hand um, the uh, as far as the selection of the regions goes. Um, we wanted to, uh, like I said, you know, try to uh, keep the stylistic elements minimal, right? So, um, uh, you know, only have it be like a piece of cloth or like a piece of a body or a piece of a rock or something like that. Uh, because the idea was that perhaps if there were a lot of different things going on um, in there that could like cause some confusion, right? Um, and uh, then, but then that's also a really interesting question because that's one of our uh, sort of, you know, other sort of next steps is um, the selection, of course, you know, this is all based on, you know, me going like, well, let's do this part and let's do this part. And, you know, we can avoid the, you know, the cracks and everything like that, obviously. But, <laughs> uh, but is there a way to, uh, to automate uh, that, that area selection process, and I, I have a, a couple of ideas that I won't, you know, I won't share just yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, but we have, you know, a couple of ideas on how to how to make that a more, a, you know, have it involve less human human actions. You know, um, thank you. Yes. And and one of the things that that was at least heartening for us is that like. Uh, you know, when you have, when you're taking a region that's a piece of cloth comparing to another region of piece of cloth, um, the naive thing might be to assume, well, because of material properties of how they mix the paints and how they thin them um, to make, to draw that particular type of, of, of drapery, maybe it'll just group all those things which are the same, you know, style together, but it didn't, right? It distinguished between cloth on one angel from another in, in four categories. So it's not just a simple, Thing that oh you paint a cloth differently than you paint a face than you paint a background right so it's not doing some kind of extremely kind of trivial categorization there's something there that it's, it's seeing in the actual brushstrokes 
uh, that it's using to basically uh, distinguish regions. Yeah, I mean, I think that was one of the really great sort of proofs, like another proof that what we were looking at was really uh, something, um, you know, something physio almost physiological, like something that, uh, you know, uh, is unique to the way that the painter was actually interacting with the paint and the canvas and not just, you know, the properties of the paint or the properties of, uh, you know, the, the, um, the type of paint or, you know, whatever uh, in that particular region. Um, yeah. I mean, one shocking thing was on our individuals, we, we looked at the the patches of different sizes and we went down to a half a millimeter which is the diameter of a single bristle and it was able to distinguish to 60 percent accuracy which is a lot more than the 25 that were random so it's doing something that we have no idea what it's doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's actually my question is kind of related to all that around materials um, as well. And it's more just kind of like, what are your thoughts about? Um, but particularly with like brushes in the studio, um, you know, distinguishing from like, I know even when I paint, I have like a brush where the bristles are just a little bit apart on this part. And so that brush stroke always has a higher part over here. Um, what are your thoughts on how those, and, and also in our historical knowledge of how these, um, of how these studios worked, um, do we know, like, were people sharing brushes or could the brushes or the materials be affecting those different hands that are coming up or has there been work that you guys have done to try to distinguish, um, you know, whether, whether a artist using two brushes would be detected as two hands or if an art, two artists sharing one brush would be detected as one? With such a complex painting like that, yeah, you could imagine that there must have been a lot of brushes. Yes, <laughs> and, and, but yeah, it's, when we did the study, there were only four groups that mm -hmm. were identified. So somehow that that was not important. Yeah, that they used different brushes, and yeah, like I said, we have no idea what it's actually looking at. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's also, um, I mean, that's part of uh, like the, the project, the newer project that we're doing with, uh, with CIA mm -hmm. is um, uh, to um, uh, really like dig into that sort of thing and say, you know, are we going to see like if the same person paints two paintings with a different brush, is it still going to recognize it as the same hand, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, when we change the paint, viscosity and that sort of thing, does that change? Does that change it? Right now, it seems like the answer is no. Um, but, uh, you know, there's also, when we're seeing, uh, you know, when we have that mess, like I showed you that mess of the network, um, you know, there, there are certainly some connections there that, you know, could be spurious or they could be uh, something where maybe something like that is part of what's happening, you know? Um, so uh, working all of those open questions are what makes this like really fun <laughs> and um is you know finding out those kinds of things like you know oh is it you know you know does the brush have uh you know have that that kind of effect and also like you know i get to really nerd out on like the history of paintbrushes which is mm -hmm. a weird thing. i won't talk about paintbrushes <laughs> how much time do we have oh, uh, uh, <laughs> Questions. Uh, I think there's one more. Um, what is Professor Gosselin asked? Uh, what is the area especially good at? Um, uh, you mentioned patterns, like future patterns of Jackson Pollock. Uh, we uh, so it's interesting. We so all the work that we've we've worked with so far um, uh, has largely been done with brushes. Um, uh, although there is some, uh, you know, uh, El Greco was known to kind of just directly stain the canvas that sort of thing too. Um, you know, so maybe using a rag or something like that. But uh, we also, um, we also uh, did a, uh, a brief kind of fun experiment uh, with uh, a guy from Box. I don't know to talk about a guy from 
and uh, um, where uh, we looked at these uh, these palette knife paintings. Um, and so, uh, you know, you could actually, um, you, you know, we're able to we're able to tell the difference between uh, different paintings done with with a palette knife, right? Um, which is a much less, you know. Uh, well, bristly, I guess, <laughs> but it seems like, you know, it would be much harder to tell the difference between there. So um, when we're talking about something like Jackson Pollock, who's, you know, throwing, throwing or dripping or something like that, um, you know, the height data perhaps might not be particularly useful, right? Um, but then again, maybe, maybe it would be, maybe it would be almost like blood splatter analysis or something like that. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I think, uh, you know, there's been work on his, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, fractal nature of his patterns and that sort of thing in the past um, that's, uh, you know, where they've been able to, you know, show like changes in the, um, you know, the structure of his paintings over time and that sort of thing. Um, it's yeah. actually one of the professors in physics uh, here at Case actually debunked some of that. <laughs> Oh, right. Like that yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, that was able to show that I think it's basically like a, a, a child's cartoon scribble could be matched by fractal analysis to like a Jackson Pollock painting. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, it's yeah. not it's super like yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, it's, you know, uh, the, those kinds of things. I think there was a there was an interesting I read recently. Um, somebody was comparing AI art to actually like, you know, dripping and that sort of thing. Like it's a, uh, so like using an AI to make, to make art is because it's a process you don't control. Um, it's very similar to the way that like, um, you know, Jackson Pollock or um, who's that guy that's on Instagram that has all the channels of paints and he just lets them run, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, somebody like that where there's just a, a like a, an automated process that makes things, uh, you know, sort of an interesting combination there. So I forgot about the, yeah, he debunked that, which is great. I'd like to, since uh, our time is coming to a close, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for their time and for being here. Uh, and I'll pass it over to um, Michael. Great. Well, thank you, Sarah, for moderating. Um, this is great. I mean, it's great to, um, when we were sort of, uh, learning about different collaborations in AI, just knowing that this group and so um, Andrew and Ken and Mohammed, I don't think we were, I, I know we've only, you did my, um, we met uh, during the summer when we had to place all the students in emergency internships and you were in Egypt and I placed you with a guy in Atlanta. So it's good to meet you in person. Um, and Mike and Clara, thank you. Um, it's a great group. Um, thanks, Mike Fisher, our friend and BIR, for helping kind of curate this. It's a great way to head into the summer, and it's great to meet all of you who are here today and joined on Zoom and on LinkedIn as well, and we hope to do more of this in the fall. So um, thank you again for participating today, and have a wonderful summer. Thank you.